Okay, thanks a lot, everybody, for joining us here today on this new webinar. So uh, what we're doing with this is uh, we're actually trying to test a new webinar service. And so uh, we're really glad that uh, you guys were able to join us here today for our live audience test. Uh, yeah, we're wanting to test a new webinar service because we want to be able to start to, you know, introduce more interactivity in the webinars and then also, uh, you know, begin to, uh, you know, do these webinars much more frequently and things like that. So again, thanks everybody for joining us here. So with today's webinar, uh, we're going to do something a little bit special, a little different uh, than we usually do. Uh, we're actually going to meet some members of the algorithmic team. And so today I have with me uh, Dan and Keston. Uh, they're with the integrations uh, development team. And so what we're going to do is just kind of like a little fireside chat with the developers. Uh, these are the guys that make the cool tools uh, that we love to play with. So it'll be really fun just to kind of, you know, get to know them, get to know uh, a bit more about what they do here at Algorithmic. So uh, to start, uh, we'll just we'll just jump in with some uh, introductions. So uh, first off here, let me just stop the kind of the slide presentation. So I'll start with myself. Um, I, my name's Wes McDermott. I'm the integrations uh, product manager. Uh, I have the benefit of working with a really cool team uh, at Algorithmic, and that is the integrations team. I really love working with these guys. It's an awesome uh, group. So I'm really thrilled to have me, Dan and Keston here. And like I said, my two coworkers are here with me. Also, uh, I'd like to do a shout out to the other integration uh, team members. So uh, say uh, a big shout out to Josh Coyne, Josh Green, and Laurent uh, Lucier. So uh, Dan, uh, why don't you take it from here? Hi everyone, my name is uh, Dan Stover. I'm a software engineer here at Algorithmic and I work on the integrations team. Keston. Oh. Uh, hey everybody, my name is Keston Gregory and I am a QA analyst for the integrations team. And I work on pretty much every integration that, uh, that we release, really. Awesome. Thanks a lot, guys. So uh, like I said, everybody, uh, we are just going to do like a little fireside chat with these guys. I've got some uh, questions. I'm going to do a little interview here and just uh, get a peek into what happens uh, in the daily uh, kind of workflow with integrations. Uh, before we do that, though, I want to make a, an announcement here for Algorithmic. Uh, so today, uh, available today, we have a new material drop on Substance Source, uh, and that is uh, coming to us from uh, Daniel Tiger. Now, Daniel is currently lead environment artist at Bungie in Seattle, and he worked on both uh, games in the Destiny series. Uh, for Substance Source, uh, Daniel produced a selection of 15 fully procedural ground materials, and they're so detailed uh, that they're virtually, virtually indistinguishable from scan materials. Uh, now, I've gotten to know Daniel. Uh, he's a very cool guy and a world-class artist. Uh, so uh, be sure to check out this new drop uh, that we released today. Uh, this drop also contains the SBS files, so you can download the actual Substance Project files, uh, jump in, uh, take a look at the graph, and just kind of see how Daniel put these together. Also, uh, we have a webinar, a specific webinar uh, with Daniel next week. It's going to be on the 25th. I think that's on a Thursday. Uh, and Daniel's going to walk us through the creation of one of his materials. So uh, be sure to check out that. Now, we're going to have more information on how you can register for that early next week. So again, just stay tuned to our channels, you know, Facebook, Twitter, and our Discord. Okay, so before we actually just kind of jump into the chat, one of the things that uh, I wanted to do here uh, was just kind of just run through a, a small presentation, uh, nothing too boring, uh, hopefully, um, and just kind of give you guys an idea about the substance format itself. Um, so here you can see that I've got uh, this little chart uh, that I kind of use. Uh, this is actually a chart that we have on our integrations page. So at the very first slide here, I'll just go back. Um, I don't know if you had a chance to see this earlier, but we have this link. This is just a link to our Substance documentation page. So if you go to the documentation page, you'll see that we have this Substance integration uh, pay, uh, basically section to that. So if you click on that, that'll take you to uh, all the information about the integrations we support. So you'll see information on like Maya, Modo, 3S Max, and so on. Also covering our game engines. Uh, you, you'll have Unreal Engine, Unity, and very soon Lumberyard documentation as well. So um, here, in that space, uh, we have a couple sections, like one of which is just explaining kind of the substance format and other sections explaining, you know, um, how to uh, basically hook up different connections for your substance to different third party renderers. And we're going to kind of talk about that today as well. So anyways, what I have here is this little flow chart and it just kind of shows that you have our, our core, uh, you know, solutions here, like we have substance designer. Substance source and substance share and all of these tools can produce or um, deliver to us uh, via download 
when I'm talking about source or share, an SBS AR file, and that's a substance material file. And that substance material file can then be uh, Im imported directly through a substance plugin, which would then go into either a game engine, like I said, we support Unreal Engine, Unity, Lumberyard, CryEngine, uh, or it could be a DCC application like Max, Maya, Moto, and things like that. And so today, specifically, we're going to take a look at the 3DS Max uh, integration. And that's why I have with me Dan and uh, Keston. So Dan was the developer on the 3DS Max plugin, and Keston was our QA lead. And so, uh, like I said, we're just going to look at how that process works. But your SPSAR file can get loaded in through a plugin into you know, your favorite game engine or your DCC application. Now, with that, you also have the ability to take the SBSAR file and import that into Substance Painter. And that's going to come in as either a, um, a filter, or it could be a generator, a base material, or even a texture. So those are kind of the different usages that you can have with an SBSAR file. Now, one last thing that I want to talk about with this uh, before we kind of get into talking to Dan is that uh, when you have a Substance, our, like, again, that's our SBSAR file here. Let me just jump back that slide here. So we have our SBSAR. And let's just say that we're going to get this material from Substance Source or something you downloaded free from Substance Share. So we have this SBSAR file. And the outputs of the substance, when it comes specifically from source, it's going to be authored using either the metallic roughness or the specular glossiness PBR workflow. Now, both of these outputs are going to be geared for use with uh, physically based renderers or uh, physically based real time shaders. And so those are going to be the two outputs. Now, the question comes to mind like, well, what happens if I want to use, let's say, V-Ray or I'm using Corona or something that doesn't directly support those types of outputs? Well. What's really unique about Substance is we're always developing the textures and the materials, uh, again, geared towards physically based rendering. So the data that's represented either in metallic roughness or, or spec gloss, those, those data is, is, is there and can be represented through a uh, you know, physically based renderer. Now, spec gloss is geared specifically for real time shaders. So when we are looking at doing, say, maybe a ray trace rendering, like today we're going to look at V-Ray, uh, you're going to need to be able to take those metallic roughness outputs and convert them. So here in my next slide, you can see that here's an example of uh, inside a substance designer, and I'm authoring my own custom substance. And maybe what I want to do is uh, use this uh, base uh, base color converter node, which then allows me to uh, select from different third-party renderers, for instance, V-Ray GGX, or we could do RenderMan PXR Surface or whatever. And it's going to take those metallic roughness outputs and then convert those to the outputs that you need. So you could then generate your own outputs, you know, custom outputs, and then just use this converter node, plug it into that, export your substance, and you're ready to go. Now, that's in like a very customized kind of workflow. Now, what we're going to show today uh, with our 3DS Max plugin, here, let me just stop this presentation. What we're going to show today with our 3DS Max plugin is kind of the mindset that we want to take with the integrations is that we want the integration uh, in a specific application to be able to handle the, the conversion for you automatically. And so this is something that we, as in the integration team, are looking to do and to handle with all of our plugins. And we have started this initiative with the 3DS Max plugin, uh, which is uh, we're, we're uh, getting ready to do a release candidate. Is that right, Dan? We're at 1.0? Correct. Yes, we are preparing for release 1.0. Um, we're not too sure. We won't have a specific date, but uh, soon TM. <laughs> yeah, so we, we did the beta. It was last? When did the beta hit? It was last year, right? December? Was it? Did it come out in November? Around yes. Autodesk University. Yes, around Autodesk University, mid-November. Okay, great. So we had the beta out already, so you can already use that. And like Dan said, we're going to have the uh, version 1.0 is coming out. Now, we did have the plugin in 3ds Max before, but it was very, very old legacy. So Dan's completely reworked it, and he's done a fantastic job with this new plugin. And with that, uh, we have these new uh, automated workflows, which we're going to kind of showcase uh, when we get into kind of the hands-on portion of that. So that's just a quick rundown of what the substance format does and how you can use it with an integration. Now, with that, what we want to do in this kind of special webinar is just kind of get to know uh, some of the development team behind the plugin. You know, and like I said, Dan worked on the plugin. He is the um, the developer, and Dan, uh, and then Keston, we've got is our lead uh, QA who who also helped work with the plugin. So, uh, Dan, I just got some questions for you just to kind of run through. So, uh, first thing I wanted to ask you, Dan, is uh, can you tell us a little bit about your development background? You know, how how did you get started? Sure. Um, I started at uh, Full Sail University. Actually, I originally wanted to make video games. Uh, I be in the gaming industry, um, and. Uh, 
I worked on indie games for two years after uh, after college before finding a home here at Algorithmic. Uh, I've been at Algorithmic for going on two years now. Awesome, awesome. So um, when you started uh, 3ds Max, were, were you with, with the integration? I'll say, were you familiar with 3ds Mo 3ds Max before starting the integration, or did you need to like have to familiarize yourself with it first before you started the actual plugin? I actually. I had seen 3ds Max previously, but I've, I have never actually worked with it before starting the plugin. So it was a, a very learn, a very long learning process. Um, oh yeah, big big learning curve. So yeah, I'll, there's there's I'll, tons of different workflows, and I'm still learning. So yeah, great. Yeah, yeah. Well, aren't we all? Uh, hmm. So one of the things I'll ask too, Dan. This is something that uh, I've always wondered about. Like, what what are the first steps that you take in designing integration? Like, I'm sure you don't just jump in and start coding stuff. Like, what, what what's the first step to that? Sure. Well, this one was uh, a little bit different. Uh, as you mentioned, we had the original plugin uh, from previously, and, and the, the first thing we did was we evaluated that to figure out what that plugin did right uh, and what we can improve upon. Um, from there, uh, development planning, and and then we were able to start production. Okay, great. Yeah. So that was a that was a question. Like Max is a big program. I mean, so you, did you start from? Were you able to use any of that original code, or, or did you start from scratch? We definitely referenced the original code while we were planning, um, but due to the evolution of our tools and the 3ds Max SDK, um, very little was actually reused. Okay. Wow. Cool. Um, so, uh, you know, when you look at the development process, is there any part of that that you like the most? Like something that you really enjoy about it? On this particular project, I think uh, the thing I would say I liked the most was definitely working with uh, the render automation um, with Max Script. That was an incredible amount of fun. Oh, okay, cool, cool. Um, okay, so um, can you tell us a bit about some of the challenge you've, challenges you face creating the 3ds Max plugin? Like, was there like one thing that stood out like as the toughest challenge? I think the biggest challenge with uh, this particular integration is how many pieces there are, how many features that the plugin needs to be compatible and work with. Um, we're trying to add support and make sure the plugin works for as many renders as possible, if not all of them. Uh, and it's something we're still working on accomplishing. So that would be probably the biggest challenge. Oh, yeah. And then uh, from a user standpoint, I really like the automated render support you added. Um, how was that process done? I mean, was it was it challenging for you, uh, like, getting to know, like, all the different renderers? Like, uh, do you know what I mean? Like, you had all these different renderers. I mean, was that, like, a challenge? Um, it, it definitely took some research and uh, with the help of some amazing Amazingly talented people here. Um, that was easier than expected initially. Um, as for how that was accomplished, uh, as mentioned, that was all accomplished through 3ds Max script. Uh, and it's something that we would like to document in the near future so that anybody w who would like to create a custom workflow uh, or a workflow that we don't currently have uh, is able to do so. All right, very, very cool. Um, so here's another one that I've always found kind of interesting. Like in terms of bug reports, you know, fixes and updates. Uh, can you explain like the general process to us on how we how we manage that with 3ds Max? Like for example, like say a user submits a bug or they post in the forums with a problem. You know, you know, once they do that, what's the process to getting that issue resolved? Sure. Um... Firstly, we're, we're constantly working on improving all of the integrations. Uh, we love feedback, and we're very active on the forums looking for bug reports and feedback. Um, the particular This particular process uh, starts with us trying to reproduce in, uh, any reported issues. Uh, once we are able to reproduce the issues, we are able to pinpoint what's causing them or, or, or where, where they are located within the software uh, and ultimately work on finding a solution as, as quickly as we can. All right, very cool. Uh, and then last question here for you, Dan. Can you tell us what it's like working for algorith Algorithmic as a developer? Uh, absolutely. Um, working Alg Algorithmic has been nothing but a dream come true. Uh, I work with some of the most talented, humble, passionate people in this industry. Um, we work on cutting edge technology. At, I, I couldn't ask for more. It's a, it's, a, it's a great place to be. Awesome, Dan. Yeah, I feel the same way. Um, okay, thanks a lot, Dan. Uh, some some really good insights there. Uh, so hey, so next up, uh, Keston, man, I got some good questions for you as well. Uh, so we'll start off with uh, something similar that I asked Dan. Uh, can you tell us a little bit about your QA background? Like, how did you get started? Sure. So I graduated actually from the University of Central Florida with a game design degree. I just want to go to the game industry as well. Um, 
actually ended up getting a job out of college at uh, EA Tiburon. They make uh, men. And I worked as a contractor on men 17. Uh, I guess that's when it really clicked that QA was the career for me. I'm not really sure why, but you know, you just kind of know once you do it, that it's uh, something you have to do <laughs> for the rest of your life. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> uh, when you started testing 3ds max, were you already familiar with it or did you have to learn like 3ds max? Uh, I was mostly in school and, and personal projects. I used Maya. So it wasn't that, that alien to me, but I mean, 3ds max obviously is different than Maya. Um, Mainly, it was just learning uh, how to how the certain workflows worked, like all the material editor and all that stuff. I I didn't do a lot of rendering. I did a lot of game engine work, so I didn't really mess with that too much. But so uh, in our meetings that we have internally, um, you you talk a lot about developing a smoke <clears throat> test. Uh, can you explain a bit about that process and how does that help with uh, QA testing? Yeah, so smoke tests are extremely important uh, for QA testing. Uh, it's basically just a small group of tests that verify that the plugin is uh, working correctly to our specifications. So it basically fits all the, the core needs of the plugin. Like, can you import a substance? Can you apply the substance? Can you render the substance? All that kind of stuff. Um, basically, once that passes, then we can do more extensive, extensive testing on that plugin. And basically, we do that on each concurrent build we get. Um, just to ensure that no changes messed up any other things and that it's working as, as intended. Oh, okay, so it gives you like a, like a checklist basically and you're like, okay, well, we've got a new build. I'm gonna run through this core checklist and make sure that these things are right. Um, right, correct. And, and those work. Now, beyond that, how else do you find bugs? Do you just bang around on the buttons or like, like how, how does that work? Um, it's, it's, a, it's an art really, Wes, you know? Uh, yeah. The developers around here don't like it, but I, I like to click things. Uh, yeah. I like to click buttons a lot. I like to do things that you wouldn't do normally as a user, just to see what would happen. You know, import a substance over another one. Uh, import a substance while it's rendering. You know, that kind of stuff. Like those things may sound weird, but um, anything that can help the plugin be more stable obviously helps the plugin in its entirety. So. Oh yeah, definitely. So like kind of, do you have like a, a craziest bug you found or I don't know how to really word that. I don't mean like, I'm thinking like, was there, was there any time that you think of, you know, like, wow, I did this and this and it caused that and you never would have thought, is there anything that really sticks out in your head or is it all just kind of the same? Uh, well, <laughs> a crazy bug that I found in 3ds max actually, uh, Dan had implemented a, a caching system, which is, is very useful in 3ds max. Uh, but, Actually, I was working on a computer that had uh, a SSD with a limited space on it, so it was almost full. And uh, I was actually tweaking the substance and trying to render it in Corona. And I would notice that when I would render, I would change parameters that the substance would, uh, I mean, my, the 3ds Max would say I was out of uh, room on my hard drive. And that was weird because I had enough space when I started, but I went to go check the cache folder and it was 50 gigs and it, like we found out, me and Dan found out that actually it was caching every time you changed the substance, which was uh, insane. It shouldn't do that. It wasn't working as a caching system at all. Uh, so that was an interesting one. Yeah. Uh, well, it's a good thing you found that because I'm sure uh, the 3ds Max users would not have liked uh, that issue. <laughs> uh, it, it definitely would have slowed it down, and it did. So it definitely yeah, improved yeah. it. So, uh, do you have any specific like kind of QA challenges you recall that you can recall uh, that you faced during the 3ds Max, uh, the whole update of the plugin? Like anything weird that happened that that really was tough? Um, well, before we had the automated scripts and uh, 3ds Max, it was definitely challenging for me to try to set up Corona materials or uh, Arnold materials or anything like that because I had never really messed with you know that kind of stuff. So once we had that, it was like so easy to, to, to test and uh, iterate and all that kind of stuff. So that really, really helped out. And other than that, it was just learning, like I said, the basic workflows of 3ds Max. That was the main challenge that I faced. So, oh, okay. but those are all overcome now. So it's... yeah, <laughs> that's good. <laughs> uh, yeah. So I, I mean, also, I know you're, you're very active on our forums. Uh, and so from a QA perspective, can you let us know, like what happens when a user submits a problem on our forums? Like, what, yeah. What... So, uh, you know, 
user reports are, are like invaluable to us because you know I can't catch everything. We can't catch everything as a team. Um, there are some things that people do that I would never have thought of, and it's so useful when people post stuff on the forums about what issues they're having. And I'm, I'm sorry they're having the issues, but I'm glad that they're reporting them so we can get them fixed and help them out. Um, but when they do post on the forums, you know, they post uh, their problem. I ask them uh, if they have their their um, their substance or their mesh or their scene even, so we can uh, test it and make sure that it does actually happen, so we can actually fix it. Um, one useful thing that they can do uh, is to provide us with those, and that makes it a lot easier. So I don't have to try to uh, dig, you know, poke at straws to try to figure out, uh, grab at straws to figure out how to do something. It's just um, uh, it's, it's easier to repro, easier to fix, and then you can get back on your way to making credible art. Yeah. So um, just one of the things that I thought was really interesting, because like when I started working with you guys, it was kind of new to me uh, coming into more of a kind of a de development environment, which mm -hmm. uh, it's, it's been awesome. I've really greatly enjoyed it. So like I know the other day we were talking and you told me like, uh, OK, so when a bug comes in, like there'll be you, we put that in like a triage and then you'll kind of test it and then after that once you can verify it then it then goes into or listed as a bug is that right yeah so um, generally when a new bug comes in I, I enter it into uh, our bug tracking software uh, it goes into a triage I verify that uh, that work that uh, occurs I have repro steps then I pass that along to Dan and then he'll uh, he'll fix it he'll uh, uh, he'll move it along to, to the QA column where I, I have to look at it and make sure verify it's fixed and it gets uh, moved to the done column, and then that's uh, it goes in the next build. That's awesome. pretty much how the process goes, and that's it. <laughs> <laughs> uh, and then last thing here, can uh, can you tell us what it's like working at Algorithmic on the QA team? Like, oh, like, it's, uh, it's incredible. Sorry, uh, I work with a, a lot of great people. Uh, I, I really like coming to work every day. That's something to be proud of, honestly, to, to enjoy coming to work. Enjoy working on what you're doing. It's, it's not a grind. It's 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 definitely fulfilling. It's it's um, I like helping people out. So uh, being able to help uh, help people towards making uh, art and uh, games and everything, it's incredible. And I also have to say uh, that you know it's fun uh, finding a bug that makes Dan cringe. Uh, that's that's one of the best parts of my job. And uh, at, at the end of the day, that's all. That's what's. That's all worth it, you know. So. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> well, thanks a lot, guys. I uh, appreciate uh, you know you, you know, taking time out of your de development day to uh, sit and chat with me, and also to our audience here. Uh, I know that uh, a lot of people are always interested in you know how things work within algorithmic and uh what, what we'd like to do with these type of webinars is uh maybe try to interview more members of our team uh and and you know just so people can get an idea of what goes into the development of the software so uh one the next thing i'd kind of like to do in this webinar is uh while we're all here is uh let's just ju kind of jump into 3ds max and just take a quick tour of the plugin and how it works so uh, here, what I'm going to do is uh, just come over here to my screen. I'm going to do a quick uh, screen share here. And uh, you guys let me know if it's all right. You guys see the screen? Looks good from here. All right. So, um, well, here we are in 3ds Max. And uh, in this particular case, I'm going to be using V-Ray here. And so um, right now I'm running, I'm not running the latest build. I'm running, uh, I think, one build back. Uh, so, uh, you know, there's always things to change and work on. Uh, so I'll need to get that latest RC build from you, Dan. Uh, but here at the top, you'll notice that we now have this uh, substance um, menu system here. And so we have things like our substance settings. So if I click this here, uh, we can go in. And this is where we can set things like our, our selected engine, where we want to work with either the GPU or the CPU engine. Uh, and then here for our uh, default import import resolution, you can see that we can now uh, work with uh, different resolutions. And these are going to be like the resolution that gets set when you create the substance. So like right now, you'll notice it's set to 512. So when I add a substance, it's going to be 512. Now, one thing I'll point out here is uh, we can now work with 8K. So so Dan, that was um, something that was new for the this, this um, well, new substance uh, 3ds Max integration. Is that right? Correct. Yes. Yeah. So the, the previous plugin was did we even have did we have the GPU engine in the original? Um, no, we did. We did. Yes, we did. I do remember that. But I think it, it, it was only at 4K, so we couldn't do 8K. Correct. 
Okay, so uh, yeah, so like you said, we now have this nice little uh, settings window here. Uh, then here we have uh, a batch import. So Dan, I, I recall this was something that uh, that you worked on that uh, was actually a really cool system. So this allows us to load multiple substance files at once, which again, something that we couldn't do, uh, which I'll refer to as the legacy um, the legacy plugin that ships natively in Max. Uh, and then here, you'll see that we have these automation scripts that we were talking about. So it, early on in the presentation, I was kind of showing everybody, you know, okay, well, you know, you have your metallic roughness outputs. Those can be converted to different physically-based materials. Uh, but now, you know, the team has added these, you know, substance to Arnold, substance to V-Ray, uh, Octane here, Corona, and so on. And we can uh, use those to automatically generate the material, which we'll do here in a moment. Uh, and then something else that we have here is the substance source. So um, if I click this button here, it's going to load up uh, a web page that lets me get to substance source. And I kind of already have that going here. So let's see, where do I have that? Here we go. So it's just going to load up a web browser, and you're going to be able to see Substance Source. And then uh, here you can go through and just kind of browse for different materials. And so one of the things I did was I just searched for wood. So if you haven't used uh, Substance Source before, you can see it's you know it's our full uh, you know physically based library. Uh, so it's some of these files are procedural, some of them are built on scan data, and so on. Uh, you'll also notice that some of these files will have SBSAR and SBS. So uh, a lot of the files contain the source. Uh, designer project so you can get in and see how that was created some of them that are more geared with like um, uh, you know bitmap based they, they don't because it's just a bitmap based really um, so here like if I did a search here for say wood um, if I can spell it right you can see that you know it gives me a quick kind of filtering here and then I can go through and look for some substances and then for instance I'm gonna use this one so I'll click it here we can see what it might look like uh, get a view of the maps and so on and then here I can download and then also right next to it, it could be hard to miss, you get the actual SBS button. So if I want the project file, I can grab it here as well. So in this case, uh, what I've done is I've downloaded this substance from source. And so here we are in 3ds Max. Uh, let me open up the material editor. Now, if I want to create a, a material map, so a uh, substance, I'm gonna just do a search for substance. Now here we have two substances. Um, so Dan, th this first one, so this is the, the legacy, is that right? Correct. That is the legacy, and that is included uh, by default uh, with 3ds Max. Okay. Uh, and uh, I don't know if, if you know the answer to this, because uh, I certainly don't. Uh, do, do you know if that'll ever be removed, or is that just always going to be there? Uh, ultimately, it's something that we would like to work toward, but we wanted to leave it in for compatibility purposes to provide time for people to transition over to the new Substance plugin. Yeah, that way, yeah, when. That makes sense we released the new one, it wouldn't have broken all, all previous projects that use the original substance integration. Yeah, so when, when you, just for those watching, when you actually filter or just try to search for substance, again, you're gonna see two. So the one, this is the new plugin we've worked on that you can download from our site and install, you'll see that as substance two. So now what I'm gonna do is just left click and drag and drop that guy here into uh, the slate material editor. We'll just zoom in on it here and double click. And that's gonna give me my, um, uh, my package browser properties, I guess we could call it, with our substance presets. And I'm going to click this load substance button. So uh, I've already kind of downloaded this guy already. So I'll throw it on the desktop. Let's open it up here. And so now right off the bat, you can see that uh, we have our material. So um, grab this guy here. One of the things that I really like about this, um, Dan, was that uh, we have this nice th thumbnail here. And uh, it updates in real time, is that right, as I change the parameters and stuff, so we can use this as a um, kind of like a, a nice preview. Correct. And, um, an, and, and another new feature, um, yeah. while you're on the topic of the thumbnail, that uh, was not available in v, uh, the first version of the, of the integration, uh, is being able to change what the main substance node uh, previews, which map, um, which can be done on the right-hand side in the, the package section. Oh, that's right here, right, where it's output mm. preview. So for instance, if I wanted to look at the normal map, I can just choose that, and then that allows me to preview the uh, the normal Correct. or any other channel, right? Yeah, that's mm -hmm. that's that's a, that's an awesome addition there. Um, OK, so here is our material. <coughs> and uh, in just a bit, we'll, we'll get into some of these parameters. But let's say, you know, again, I'm working with V-Ray, so I want to just create a V-Ray material out of this. So all I have to do is just select this guy, come back here to my substance menu, and just choose substance to V-Ray. And just like that, it does uh, all of the conversion for us and it creates uh, the V-Ray material. So now here I have my V-Ray material. I have this guy selected. Um, here, let me move this out of the way a little bit. You'll notice that 
I have this little floor area here and we're just going to apply it. So that's already selected. So what I'll do is just apply that. And uh, so it's showing up black here. What I need to do is just right click on my material and, and click uh, show shaded material in viewport. So now we can see um, this material here in our viewport. And here I'm just uh, interactive, interactively rendering with V-Ray so you can see it's just it's kicking off here. Um, all right. So uh, what I'm going to do here is uh, just kind of scroll down. Well, here, let's do this so I can uh, kind of minimize some of this. Let's get rid of some of these parameters. Just close these guys up. I'm going to come over to the coordinate section here. And uh, I'm just going to type in some tiling here. So we'll just maybe try doing like a four by four here. And move this out of the way. And you can see here in our viewport, uh, it's already setting the tile correctly. And then V-Ray's uh, updating here for me. So it's uh, really interactive. And Dan, that's one thing I really want to mention. Like in all the integrations that I've been working and testing, you've been testing, I, I, the 3D specs plugin is super fast. Uh, and just changing the parameters, uh, even if we change our resolution. So for example, uh, let's come all the way back over to our substance. Ah, I'm sorry. I already had it selected. I don't need to do that. We'll come over here to our package browser. Let's see. Presets. Not that. Output settings. Sorry about that. Fit them over. So this is our current resolution. So if I want to switch this to, say, like 2K, you can see that, you know, it's already updated here. 2K, it's really quick. And here it is rendering in V-Ray. So, um, yeah, we can make changes pretty fast. So one of the things that, of course, is a benefit to Substance is the ability to come in and just tweak a lot of these settings. So uh, if I come over here to where we have this uh, parquet mahogany, um, this is where I can start to make some changes here uh, to these different parameters. And so just to keep it kind of simple here, I'll try to minimize my viewport here a little bit. Let's do this. So here we've got, we have this uh, pattern type and it's set to English. So what I'm going to do is just set this to a single herring, herringbone here. And so now you can see that uh, it's making a change here to the actual pattern in V-Ray's updating here for me. And uh, so what I'm going to do is uh, come over here to where I have, let's see here, the... Uh, Let's here. Let's do this. Sorry, guys. Uh, I'm working on this much smaller. Usually, I have two monitors, and I'm not having to move all this stuff around everywhere. But here, let's just check it here in the viewport. Um, so let's just scroll here down to where we have the coordinates, and maybe I'll try tiling this a little bit more like this. And uh, of course, we can also make uh, you know dozens of other changes that you can see here. So, like for instance, if I start to adjust my x amount, uh, we can get a change here. So here, let's take the y amount and just move it down. You can see that again. It's it's the updating is really fast, which is one of the things that uh, really impressed me the most about the plugin. So here we've get uh, just a quick sample setup here of, of what this is now. Uh, one of the new things that were added in this plugin is the ability to work with all the presets. So here we have our substance presets. And uh, so Dan, can you just talk a little bit about this setting? Because I know that uh, a lot of hard work went into setting this up. Sure. Um, so presets are something that we have started to focus on in, or substance source or include with substance source assets. Um, so whenever you import a substance, some substances will actually have embedded presets. And what a preset is, is it's just a saved file of um, the state of uh, all the inputs or a save of all the, the input states. Um, so if you change all your inputs and you want to keep altering a substance to see different variations without losing um, a particular uh, particular set of values, uh, you could easily create a preset and be able to switch back and forth um, between various settings with one click of a button. Uh, the nice thing about the presets here as well is the presets are compatible with um, other integrations uh, and uh, the, the flagship tools. So um, if you create presets here, for example, you could import a preset file into um, a game engine that uses Substance and apply that to a Substance in um, various integrations. Yeah, so like you're saying, Dan, if I create a preset here, so I have this preset, and and so right now I've switched the pattern completely, changed some of the settings as well. So I can just create a preset out of this, and whoops, the preset, uh, let me bring that over onto this monitor. So we could just call this, uh, I don't know, I'm just going to say preset uh, 01. So now, it's a terrible name, <laughs> but uh, preset 01. And so now I have this kind of preset saved. 
So if I want to go back and change this to, let's say, uh, I don't know, let's go back to just the English here. And so now we have kind of this English pattern uh, and then we'll create a preset. Uh, window keeps popping up on my other monitor. Drag that guy back over here and we'll say preset zero two, okay. All right, so now we have these two guys. Uh, if I just click the preset or double click on it here, it's going to uh, just set me back to that first preset. So uh, this is really nice little preset manager that we have here. And you can see I can quickly just you know jump back and forth. And as you were saying, Dan, I could choose to export this selected preset and then I could use that in another integration. So um, one of the other things that I'll kind of mention with presets too, uh, with Substance Source, uh, we also have um, the, and guys, please correct me if I'm wrong, but Substance Source, do all of those have presets or is there's, not all of them, there's a set number of them that have preset files, right? Or presets embedded. Yes. Okay. There are, there's a, uh, yeah. Yeah, yeah. So um, again, if th this particular one did, now Dan, this was a question I had. If, so, this substance I did get from source. If it had presets embedded in it, would they just show up here? Correct. Uh, whenever you import that particular substance, uh, all of the embedded presets would be loaded into that preset window and can be changed just as if you had created the presets, uh, just as you uh, just demoed. OK, perfect. Uh, and so one of the things that we had talked about uh, is it was an update in Substance Designer 2017. Dot, I'm sorry, I don't remember <laughs> which one. But uh, we did uh, one of our kind of uh, webinars on that. Uh, was that uh, we now allow you to create presets directly in Designer. So if you are authoring your own like custom materials in Designer, uh, you can choose to create presets and they will be embedded in that SBSAR file when you publish that. So again, when using the 3S Max plugin, any of those preset files you create in Designer will show up here as well. Hey, uh, Wes. Yeah. Ario has a question in the chat. Uh, he Yes. Are those presets saved into the SBSAR file? Uh, I guess you just elaborated on that. Uh, you can do that in Substance Designer, but the the uh, the presets made in 3ds Max or uh, in other integrations, they don't stay in the SBSAR file in the integration. But uh, you're, uh, you're able to import those. Yeah, that's correct. Uh, and and Dan, yeah, you guys confirm um, it doesn't. Well, it doesn't save that back into the SB, SBSAR file. So when you this when you export the preset, it basically saves it as a. a well, I forget the extension. I think it's SBS uh, a, PRS. A P, PRS. Yeah, yeah. this is the actual file that we can use. But if you like, you said if we. Uh, or in designer and you create the preset and uh, check our YouTube channel because we have some specific training on how to do that. Um, it will embed it in the SBSER file. Uh, okay, so um, I think that pretty much covers kind of anything that I just kind of wanted to run through with the Substance plugin. Like, uh, you know, I didn't get super in depth with it. Um, you know, just kind of a, a nice introduction. Uh, guys, can you think uh, that we wanted to cover? I think we hit some pretty much the main stuff here. Yeah, I think so as well. OK. All right, well, uh, here, let me just stop my screen share then. Come back here. So uh, everybody, uh, I just want to thank again everybody for joining us here on this webinar. Uh, we're pretty much coming to a close now. Uh, again, thanks, everybody, for joining us uh, for our live audience test. Like Again, like I said, we're trying to test this new uh, webinar system. Uh, again, just allowing us to be a bit more interactive. So we tried to do some polls uh, throughout this process, and I saw some people were voting on those. Uh, also, we um, I was able to uh, share a file, so uh, it was just our our workflow graphic. But again, in future presentations, we'd like to be able to, uh, or excuse me, future webinars, we'd like to be able to share specific like PowerPoint presentations and so on and things like that. So we feel like we can get a lot more interactive in these type. Plus we're able to uh, do uh, more than one host here or presenter. So today we've got three of us here. So again, I'm going to close everything out. Thanks a lot, everybody, for joining us. Uh, just uh, hey, chat us on the forums. Let us know how you think this format works. Also, we've got our Facebook uh, page as well. Uh, you know, let us know there. And uh, if you're also on our Discord channels as well, talk to us there. Just let us know uh, what you think about this. And then also, uh, we'd love to hear uh, any ideas uh, about uh, some things you'd like to see in future webinars. Like I said, next week, we are going to have uh, Daniel Tiger with us. And uh, he is going to run through one of his uh, fantastic uh, materials that he created uh, so stay tuned for that and like I said we are going to get uh, more information about how you can register for that uh, early next week so thanks a lot everybody uh, I'm get this is Wes I'm signing off and uh, Dan and Keston thanks a lot for joining us thank you for having me thanks everybody thanks everybody
Take care, guys. See you next time.